What's up, everyone? Welcome to Bill Browns and Dragons. I'm your host, Bill Brown Bapplestone. So today we're having another episode of my character build series. Today presenting to you the Celestial Soul Knife. This is a build that was kind of impromptu. One of my Patreon supporters said that his girlfriend wanted to play a soul knife and she couldn't find anything out there about optimizing one. And I had kind of looked at it previously and thought, wow, this is kind of a cool concept. So I was intrigued and my supporter was in need, so I decided to do the build. Um, and when I say I, of course, I mean the entire team because as a reminder, these builds are the process of a team effort where we uh, debate amongst each other potential options and alternatives and mistakes are pointed out and all of that. So uh, many thanks to all of those guys for helping me out. And if you want to be a part of it, feel free to check out the Patreon and uh, you know, if you want to support the channel. Also like, subscribe and all that fun stuff. So a uh, really cool build, my first chance to look at the Rogue. I realized it kind of makes sense to do 1 through 20 builds for every class, so I get a real strong sense of how they're built and what they need. And it was really eye-opening for me because I was unfamiliar with mechanics of sneak attack and it's actually really good. And interesting, interestingly to me, it has anti-synergy with the power attack of Great Weapon Master or Sharpshooter, which was surprising to me. And so consequently it has a whole different strategy whereas most ways of racking up damage involves getting as many attacks as possible that hit as many times as possible that do as, many, as much damage as possible, whereas the rogue is all about trying to land that one big sneak attack. And so extra attacks and things like that aren't as important, and it doesn't work with power attack. Just mathematically, they clash. So I thought that was very interesting, and consequently, I was very surprised at how well the rogue performed in terms of DPR and just all of the other stuff. So a uh, really cool build. Uh, I'm very excited to show it to you. So without further ado, let's take a look at the Celestial Soul Knight. So I've put the setup on the screen so you can see what we're doing here. We can see that Bill Braun's Celestial Soul Knife is going to be custom race with strength eight, dex 18, con 14, intelligence eight, wisdom 12, and Charisma 14. He will have small size and dark vision. And because this is a martial build, I will be comparing our build DPR to a standard DPR baseline of Agonizing Blast plus Hex hitting 60% of the time, and an elite DPR baseline of a fighter with fighting style archery, crossbow expert, and sharpshooter hitting 70% of the time. As a reminder, I give you the DPR figures in modular form so that you know what you're doing round to round based on the choices that you make. And if you want to know what kind of damage you are doing over what you consider to be an average battle, you're going to have to do a little bit more math, but I've at least given you the figures that you can do that. I'm also going to be coloring the boxes for some easy clarity, but take it all with a grain of salt, read my big block of qualifying text, and check out the three videos that I'll have linked in the description talking about DPR and how flawed of a metric it is but I will be attempting to color the boxes and thereby making some assumptions. But generally speaking, red will be below the standard DPR baseline, yellow will be between the standard and elite DPR baselines, green will be above the elite DPR baseline, and white will be way above the elite DPR baseline, by which I mean at least 120% of it. The playstyle of this build is as a ranged skirmisher, popping constant sneak attacks. And it also offers a huge impact on the interaction and exploration phases with a strong suite of skills and psionic powers. But do note that a centerpiece of this build is Silent Image. So you're gonna have to talk to your DM about how he handles illusions. Because everything in this build works rules as written, but some DMs consider rules as written illusions to be overpowered and consequently they write in all sorts of unnecessary mechanics that make it not as good. So make sure everyone is on the same page. Don't commit to this build if the DM is going to constantly be working against you and you're going to be aggravating him by trying to play this character. In any case, see my deep dive series video on Major Image for more detail about combat illusions and talk to the DM and make sure that this character is right for the table. And also note that I dip on this build just to round out its abilities and defenses, but you could go straight rogue. 
The trade-off is that you get better sneak attack damage if you go straight rogue, so that will increase your DPR and make it quite impressive, but you would also be more one-dimensional and you would lack all of the other stuff that I dip to add to this build. Still, if you don't like the dip that I chose, you can do a different dip and you can go straight. The base kit is pretty good. So at level one, we start as rogues to get two expertise and sneak attack, and our starting feat is going to be squat nimbleness which is a half feat that will bump our starting dex to 18, which is really nice. It confers to us an elite starting move of 35. In practice, that's really good. That extra plus five is all you need to outkite creatures that move only 30, given sufficient space. And that's a considerable percentage of the creatures in fifth edition. Squat Nimbleness gives us an extra skill proficiency, which is nice because we have a pretty expansive skill set and we have Psy Bolstered Knack to help us with skills. It makes us slippery versus grapple attempts with advantage on acrobatics rolls, and I think that's really cool. So I very much like Squat Nimbleness as a starting feat for us, mostly because of the half feat aspect of it bumping our starting decks to 18. Note that Wood Elf is an alternative option here. It had some champions in my Discord, and I decided against it because not starting at Dex 18 is actually pretty important that has lots of ripple effects throughout the build, negative ones. So all told, I do think starting with your Dex at 18 is better for the build, but Wood Elf is pretty good. It makes you a better hider, and you'd eventually have access to Elven Accuracy, which can be cool because when you have an increased crit rate plus sneak attack, sometimes you really pop off, and that's always fun. So feel free to consider Wood Elf, but in my estimation, it's not as good as what we actually did. Our starting weapons are going to be the Dagger and the Light Crossbow and the Rapier. Now this gets kind of complicated for level 1. We can either melee and fight two weapon style with two daggers, and if we choose to fight melee, we can go indefinitely, although that's dangerous and people might hit us and we try to avoid that. Or we can strike with the same playstyle as we'll have once our Psychic Blades come online, and this is preferred in my opinion, by throwing two daggers per round, which we can actually do on rounds one and two, and then in rounds three we will switch to the Light Crossbow. Now this gets complicated, but we're able to do two daggers in rounds one and two because of the fact that interact with object can be done on both rounds one and two. And so you can get two daggers into your hands in those two rounds. But once we get to round three, we won't be able to do that anymore. And we're going to switch to the light crossbow because that has a higher base damage. Now, a second attack is very strong at level 1 and in tier 1, not just because it gives you more damage and it allows you to spread that damage around, but particularly with rogues, a second opportunity to stick sneak attack has a big impact on our DPR. Remember, with rogues, the whole point is to stick that sneak attack. It's not necessarily to rack up a bunch of hits and damage through those hits. It's about doing damage through sneak attack. Which means that if we stick our sneak attack on the first attack, then the second attack isn't necessarily important. It's not going to have as big an impact on our DPR. And so when we hit the sneak attack on the first attack, feel free to use a different bonus action. Remember, we get cunning action at the next level. So we're going to have some bonus action options besides a second attack that we might want to take if we hit that sneak attack on the first one. We're also going to carry the rapier for emergencies in case we are in a constrained environment and we don't have daggers in our hands and we only get one interact with objects so we can't pull more than one. We might use the rapier for one round until we can get two daggers in our hands. Our armor will be studded leather plus dex for a decent 16, presuming that you can afford it as it's not part of the rogue starting equipment. And our starting proficiencies will be perception with expertise, stealth with expertise, Performance, Deception, Persuasion, Insight, Acrobatics, and Thieves Tools. Oh, well, obviously you can pick different ones if you prefer. And our round one will be a dagger attack plus a bonus action dagger attack, plus an interact with object to draw another dagger. Then in round two, we'll do a dagger attack, an interact with object to draw a second dagger, and then a bonus action dagger attack. Then in round three, we pull the light crossbow and start attacking with that. I know, very complicated stuff for first level, but it results in a lot of damage and we start with a white DPR box, because we are doing great damage relative to the baselines. And spoiler alert, we're gonna be white all through tier one. So this is actually a very strong tier one build. 
At level two, Cunning Action is online. And man, I love Cunning Action. A bonus action hide, dash, or disengage is so good. The bonus action hide is crazy good as a defensive option when you have obscurement in play. Being hidden will also give you the advantage that you need to proc your sneak attack. Bonus action dash is fantastic and has synergy with our 35 foot move from squat nimbleness. Bonus action disengage is awesome, which has synergy with our ranged attacks because we can always get space without incurring an opportunity attack. And because we have bonus action disengage at this point, we're never going to need the rapier unless we find ourselves in melee with a construct or something. So no change to our offensive rounds one through three, but because of the cutting action, we now have a defensive option, which we will have going forward. I'm going to be doing offensive and defensive options going forward. And for defense, we are just going to be using the light crossbow and a bonus action cutting action. Hide, assuming the necessary environment, or a dash or disengage. So we have the option of standing in and pumping out attacks, landing as many sneak attacks as possible, or we can be slippery and skirmish and be hiding and dashing and all of that. Obviously, which one you choose is going to depend on the scenario. So at level three, we officially become soul knives and add steady aim, our psionic energy dice, psi bolstered knack, psychic whispers, and psychic blades. Steady aim is useful sometimes, I guess, but typically we're going to have better things to do with our bonus action. More importantly, Psionic Powers is online for really great utility. I mean, both of these are really good. Psy Bolstered Knack is a fantastic buff to all our proficiencies, and we don't expend the Psionic Energy Diet unless we succeed, which is really cool. We can just spam it, and we only expend the die when it makes the difference. That's great. Psychic Whispers is also really good. I mean, it just locks in those covert party comms, and it solves so many interaction issues with translations. It's essentially a Rary's telepathic bond plus tongues that is going to have a massive impact in the interaction space. Very nice ad for us. Finally, Psychic Blades are online. This is our signature ranged attack option. It's going to be replacing daggers and the light crossbow and all of that. This is what we do from here on out. This is going to allow us a second attack with our bonus action that does stat damage without investing a feat. Plus, just thematically, it's really cool. You can never be disarmed. You're walking around. You never have weapons in your hand. And the next thing you know, whew, psychic blade. And someone falls over dead without a mark on them. I mean, that's really cool. One thing that's not so cool is that because the psychic blades aren't actually in your hand and we can only technically manifest them on our turn, we cannot use them for opportunity attacks. They also don't synergize with things like Sharpshooter or Booming Blade or Extra Attack. So on the surface, it seems like they might be problematic, but I promise you, as we go through the build, it turns out that's all you need because it's mostly a vehicle for sneak attack. Now, the 60-foot range is not amazing. You might want to keep the light crossbow around just in case you need some range. And also because about 5% of creatures are immune or resistant to psychic damage and most of those are immune to it. So you're gonna to wanna to keep some physical weapons available just in case we need non-psychic damage. Our rounds one and two clean up a little bit. If we're going offense, it's attack plus bonus action attack, just landing as many sneak attacks as possible. And if we go defensive, it's one attack plus bonus action, cunning action. And our DPR box is still white. The damage from this combo is really fantastic in tier one. At level four, we mix things up a little bit and we add a level of Celestial Warlock to add Healing Light, four cantrips, two spells known, and one spell slot. For cantrips, we're gonna be adding Light and Sacred Flame, Minor Illusion, and Friends. Light and Sacred Flame came with a subclass. I don't see ever using either, although Sacred Flame is an option versus Psychic Community. More importantly, we added Minor Illusion for Trixiness and Elite Defense for a ranged attacker, because Minor Illusion can create perfect obscurement to enable sneak attack. In my opinion, it's the best cantrip in 5th edition, so see my Deep Dive series video on Major Image for more info on combat illusions. A lot of it is pertinent to Minor Illusion as well. We also added Friends. Friends is an awesome no-save option that can win you some interactions. It's not affected by charm immunity or resistance, it does have that annoying one minute duration after which it creates hostility, but that can actually be good for starting fights, especially when combined with Disguise Self. 
which, spoiler alert, we're going to be adding here very soon. Our two spells known are going to be Hex and Cure Wounds. Remembering that our spell slots come back on a short rest. Hex is a solid bonus action option for round one if our first attack hits and lands that sneak attack. Then it makes sense to drop a Hex with your bonus action. But Hex isn't a big deal for us. It's a placeholder that we're going to be dropping at the next level anyway. Cure Wounds is always fantastic, but especially for a Warlock, because we get to use high-level slots on Cure Wounds before every short rest, and then we get them back. So that actually, over the course of gameplay, is going to generate quite a bit of healing for ourselves and the party. And for combat heals, we have Healing Light Online. For a sweet, bonus action ranged heal, very much like a quasi-healing word. Healing Light and Cure Wounds together gives our build a fantastic healing element which you wouldn't normally expect to see on a rogue slash warlock. So we are really contributing to the party in a lot of different domains here. We're going to be pumping out a lot of damage, a lot of healing, a lot of utility for a very effective character. Note that we can use up to 2d6 with each heal, but avoid doing that as that's low return on investment. You want as many instances of a 1d6 heal as possible, generally speaking. And note that you don't have to go with Celestial here. Looking over all of the Warlock options, I think both the Hexblade and the Undead are excellent options. The Hexblade is going to get us Hexblade's Curse, which is going to allow us to crit more often, and critting when you have Sneak Attack is really fun. So that can be a good option. And also the Undead Warlock is interesting. That one gets Form of Dread, a proficiency times per day. And that has some nice benefits. You get temporary hit points, you're immune to fear, and you force a save against fear every round. Now, I decided not to go with that here for several reasons, one of which is that it lacks synergy with our primary tactic of leveraging obscurement, which we'll talk about at the next level. And it also gets Phantom Steed baked into its spell list, which is fantastic, because I love Phantom Steed but it can be annoying to leave it up to your DM whether you get access to it or not, especially if you're in like a low magic setting or something. So Undead can be a very good option here, but we went with Celestial. I think Celestial is best overall, and it gives us that extra healing element to the build, which I like quite a bit. Note that the DPR dipped a tad as the target AC bumped and our attack bonus didn't, and our rounds one and two change up a little bit. On offense, we are adding a Hex option for our first round bonus action, and we can also do Healing Light at any time as needed. And if we go defensive, it's Attack plus Bonus Action Cunning Action, or Healing Light if needed. At level 5, we move into Tier 2. I put a reminder of our cantrips, spells, known, and proficiencies, which I'll do for every tier. And we add a second level of Celestial Warlock to bring our invocations online. So our spells known will be Cure Wounds, Hellish Rebuke, and Charm Person, Dropping Hex. Hellish Rebuke is intended to give us a decent reaction that doesn't pressure our concentration, remembering that we don't even have opportunity attacks because we're using Psychic Blades and we don't have them when it's not our turn. Also, Hellish Rebuke is kind of a placeholder because we're dropping it at level 7 anyway. And I added Charm Person as an interactions option that doesn't pressure our concentration, and it might come in handy if we screw up an interaction. But more importantly, Eldritch Invocations are online, and we are adding Misty Visions and Mask of Many Faces. Both of these are so good. Misty Visions gives us Silent Image at will for an amazing buff to a ranged attacker. This spell has a 10 minute duration, so it is basically always on. Notably, we can expect it to be on at the start of combat meaning it has fantastic action economy. And it has a very powerful impact in creating perfect obscurement, where we can see them and they can't see us, so we have advantage on our attacks and they attack us at disadvantage. This is going to consistently proc our sneak attack, it's going to greatly increase our expected DPR, and it's a great defense because we are immune to sight spells, and even our unimpressive AC gets really nice when we're attacked at disadvantage. Furthermore, Silent Image offers fantastic trickiness for combat and the interaction phase. Let's not forget we are rogues. And we are rogues with Minor Illusion. So that has great synergy with Silent Image. It can provide the sound component. And so this is just a really fantastic core add to this build that will be our primary concentration option going forward. That's why we're dropping Hex, because it's redundant. 
we don't have concentration open for hex because we are going to be using it on silent image. Again, see my deep dive series video on major image. It'll give you more of a sense of what you can do with combat illusions, and it'll give you more stuff to talk about your DM with to make sure he's cool with. Because rules as written, this is an immensely powerful add to this build. As well, Mask of Many Faces for Disguise Self at Will is also an amazing buff to interactions. Again, we're rogue, so we are going to have synergy with our performance and deception proficiencies, and I plan to take expertise in both of these at level 12. It's got great synergy with friends because we can influence interactions and start convenient fights between people by taking on specific appearances. I mean, for an always-on ability, this is pretty insane. Misty Visions and Mask of Many Faces together are really, really good. One thing to note, we are small, and that is annoying because that's going to limit the forms that we can mimic. Remembering that we can only increase our size through Disguise Self by up to a foot. So try to be as tall as possible on this character during character creation. Remembering that a small creature can be almost four feet tall, like three feet, 11 and three quarters. That'll allow us to disguise ourselves as creatures up to five feet. And that's going to open up a lot more. That will allow us to do females of even human race. And it's going to allow us to do a lot more of the races that aren't as big as humans. So a little note that's going to make Mask of Many Faces better for you. Now note that our DPR box dropped from white to yellow. So we are no longer 120% of the elite baseline, but we are only 0.4 from being green. So basically we are at parity with the elite DPR baseline right now. So our damage is still really good and we have Misty Visions and Mask of Many Faces and all of these spells. So we're doing really well. No change to our rounds one and two. At level 6, we're back to adding a Rogue level, so we are Rogue 4 and Warlock 2 at this point. This gets us our first ASI, which will go to Dex plus 2 to max out our combat stat and our Dex skills, which bumps our numbers a bit, not quite up to the Elite DPR baseline because they also got a bump. But still, our damage is very good and our character is very effective. No change to our rounds 1 and 2. At level 7, we add a third level of Warlock so that our pack boon comes online and second level spells. So our spells known will be Cure Wounds, Charm Person, Spider Climb, and Invisibility, dropping Hellish Rebuke. We add Spider Climb because it is a quasi fly in many scenarios and fly is an auto win versus 60 to 70% of enemies. So we're gonna take that all day long. Spider Climb is a big add for us here. And we also add Invisibility, which is an amazing utility option since we're the sneaky type. Remember, we have expertise in stealth. So now that we can turn invisible, that's a big add for our rogue build. Finally, the Pact Boon is online, and we are going to be going with Pact of the Chain so that we get an elite and awesome familiar. Like a regular familiar, but better because they can turn invisible and have hands and are intelligent and yada yada yada. See my deep dive series video on advanced familiar tactics for more info. That's just about basic familiars, but it will at least give you an idea of what you can do with them. But be aware we do plan to switch to Pact of the Tome at level 9 to give us a great lineup of cantrips and to set up the Book of Ancient Secrets at level 10, which is part of the build. It's going to bring back the familiar plus a few other things. No change to our DPR situation, no change to our rounds 1 and 2. At level 8, we add another level of Soul Knife, so Rogue 5, Warlock 3, which bumps our Sneak Attack, bumps our Psionic Energy Dice, and brings Uncanny Dodge online to give us a decent defensive reaction. It replaces Hellish Rebuke as our main reaction, and our DPR box is yellow, but only 0.2 from being green. So again, parity with the Elite DPR baseline here. No change to our rounds 1 and 2. At level 9, we add a 4th level of Celestial Warlock. We get a Cantrip, which will be Mage Hand for ranged utility. Our spells known will be Cure Wounds, Spider Climb, Invisibility, Suggestion, and Lesser Restoration, dropping Charm Person. This is a really nice lineup of spells known. They're all utility, so they're not going to pressure our very few slots, but when we cast them, they're all going to have a massive impact. Suggestion is a very nice add, both for combat and for utility, which I'm very happy to have at this level, even though we we're dropping it at the next level. And then, of course, Lesser Restoration is a self-explanatory add. It's always awesome. I really like the healing abilities. I'm really happy that this build offers some really nice healing, and Lesser Restoration just continues that trend. 
And we get an ASI here, which we are going to be devoting to Fighting Initiate, Dueling, which is going to bump our DPR. Now we could have taken Thrown Weapon here, but Dueling is better because it also applies to melee, and we don't need the Quick Draw Rider of the Thrown Weapon fighting style because we have Psychic Blades. So we went with Dueling here. It's always going to proc because we always only have one weapon in our hand. And here we are going to switch from Pact of the Chain to Pact of the Tome. You have to do it when you get an ASI, so we have to do it here. Even though it's a little bit early, I would much rather change this out next level, but we can't. But do note that we will be able to keep our familiar until it dies, despite making this switch. So we can actually keep it at this level as long as we protect it. Don't deploy it in combat. Make sure that it's invisible and flying and not really in harm's way. And we'll still be able to make use of it. But if it dies, we're just going to have to do without a familiar. At least until we gain another level. So through our Pact of the Tome, we get three cantrips. So we are adding Guidance, Mold Earth, and Control Flames. Guidance is self-explanatory, is one of the top two cantrips in the game. Mold Earth is a really nice add for defense and utility. And Control Flames as a sneaky good utility option. It can extend the light of a bullseye lantern out to 240 feet, which can be very tactically advantageous. And it also allows you to extinguish flames, which can be a sneaky nice ability. It's actually not that easy to extinguish flames in 5th edition. No change to our round 1 and 2, but adding dueling does bump our DPR, so our DPR box is now green and we officially exceed the elite DPR baseline. And at level 10, we add a 5th level of Warlock, our final level of Warlock, to get 3rd level spells. This is fantastic. Our spells known will be Cure Wounds, Spider Climb, Invisibility, Lesser Restoration, Hypnotic Pattern, and Revivify, dropping Suggestion. So Hypnotic Pattern is an elite control option. It's one of the best spells in 5th edition, even though our save DC isn't amazing. Though that said, let's not get overly dramatic about the 3 point save DC difference. It's noticeable, but it doesn't break the spell. And do note that about 21% of all creatures are immune to charm or can't see, so you're not always going to be able to use this. But that said, Note that it does clog with Silent Image for Concentration. Silent Image is our go-to for Concentration, and it's going to be active at the beginning of most battles, so we're going to have to have a reason to drop it. Hypnotic Pattern can be that reason. It can be super powerful. But use it selectively and with discretion. You don't need to lead with it. It is not our plan A. And we're only going to want to use this at most once per short rest, because we're going to want to keep a slot open just in case we need to cast something else. Now I will say it doesn't have to be Hypnotic Pattern here. The Warlock gets some pretty good options at 3rd level. Fly, I think, is an intriguing option because it can deliver auto wins 60-70% to 70 of the time. And even though we have Spider Climb, Spider Climb might not be as good as Fly, depending on your campaign. For example, if it's an outdoor setting, Fly is going to be way better than Spider Climb. Devoting a 3rd level slot to a spell that gets you a win 60-70% to 70 of the times is really good return on investment. Or you might consider one of the summoning spells. Warlock gets Summon Undead, Summon Shadow Spawn, Summon Lesser Demons. So those can be options if Hypnotic Pattern is too boring for you or you're fighting a lot of stuff that's immune to it. Especially because these spells have one hour durations. And that can be sweet because they can stick around and affect multiple battles as opposed to a single one-shot spell with a poor save DC like Hypnotic Pattern. Frankly, I could very much see taking a summon here instead of Hypnotic Pattern. So, up to you, some good options here. I do love adding Revivify. So good to have Revivify. To me, always add it when it's available because you want two party members with it. And that way you're covered. If anybody dies, you can still bring them back. Also note that because our slots bump to third level, our invisibility upcasts to two different targets. For example, ourselves and our mount. That can be good because we're going to be on a mount from now on, folks, because we have the Book of Ancient Secrets online. We get a third invocation, and so now we get a couple of rituals. We'll start with Find Familiar and Speak with Animals. Find Familiar is obviously an amazing ad for utility and defense. We're going to take that owl for the flyby help action. That can proc advantage on a single attack, and that means we can proc sneak attack. And if we keep it in our backpack, that means we will always proc sneak attack in melee. Which seems weird, but those are the rules as written. So yeah, really nice ad for us. See my deep dive series video on advanced familiar tactics for more info. 
I think speak with animals is a nice ritual to add here. It's going to complement our telepathy, and we can now communicate with even more living beings. But the big add is Phantom Steed. We can add this to our book if we get it as a scroll. So this is going to be table dependent, of course. Ideally, there's a wizard in the party who also has Phantom Steed and he can help you out. Or you're playing in a game with a vibrant market, like you're in Waterdeep or something. And then you can get it through a scroll just by laying out the gold. But talk to your DM. If the DM is playing a setting where he doesn't feel like he should give you a good shot at getting a Phantom Steed scroll, I might prefer to stick with Pact of the Chain or switch to the Undead Warlock so that it's baked into the spell list. But talk to him about that because Phantom Steed is a big ad here. It's the whole point of us going with Book of Ancient Secrets. So it would be annoying to go in this direction and then he is like, nope. But yeah, if we can add Phantom Steed, then we're doing so good because Phantom Steed offers the best maneuverability in 5th edition. We'll be moving up to 200 feet per round with a ritual. I think this is literally the best third level spell in the game. So very happy to add it here. Plus, we can cast invisibility on it now and cover us both. See my Deep Dive series video on Phantom Steed for more info on this awesome, awesome spell. Slight change to our offensive round one. We are adding the hypnotic pattern option. Otherwise, no changes and no change to our DPR situation. We are still solidly green. At level 11, we enter tier three and we add a level of fighter. So Rogue 5, Warlock 5, and Fighter 1. This is going to add a fighting style, which for us will be Throne Weapon Fighting, and Second Wind. So the only reason that we're doing a Fighter Dip here is so that we can add Throne Weapon Fighting. We can't take Fighting Initiate a second time, which would be my preference. I don't really like dipping here, but it makes a huge difference to the build, so we're going to do it. We get to add Second Wind, which, hey, okay, I'll take it. It results to no change to our round one and two, but it does bump our underlying numbers and it keeps us solidly yellow, even though the elite DPR baseline takes a big jump at level 11. That's when they get extra attack times too. So we're only about two points off of that. So still doing very well at level 11. At level 12, we add another level of rogue. So it's rogue six to add expertise times four. So we're gonna add expertise to performance and deception but of course you can pick different ones. No change to our round one and two, no change to our DPR situation. At level 13, we add another level of rogue and evasion comes online. This is going to bump our defense and our sneak attack bumps, which means our DPR bumps, which means we are now green. And this is the last time we ever lag behind the elite DPR baseline. We are always going to be either green or white for the rest of our career. At level 14, we add another level of rogue we get another ASI, so Lucky is online for those sweet rerolls. One of the best feats in the game, I always try to add it. No change to our DPR situation, no change to our round one and two. Level 15 is a nice level for us as we add Rogue 9 and Soul Blades comes online to give us an additional couple of psionic powers. We get Homing Strikes, which is awesome because it increases our DPR significantly by virtually assuring that the sneak attack lands. This is especially true for using the defensive tactics, because when you're only using one attack, homing strikes makes a big difference. It's also cool that we only expend the psionic energy die on a success, and we've got like 11 of them now. So this is something that we're going to be doing regularly, and we only spend the die on a success. That's fantastic. Oh, and we get psychic teleportation. This is one of the coolest powers in the game, man. I mean, it's obviously comparable to Misty Step, and it's actually not as good because it can't defeat total cover. But it also defeats Silence, which a lot of those spells can't do. It's just an elite maneuverability power. Man, I like psychic teleportation. That is so cool thematically. And because our sneak attack bumped and we get the bonus from homing strikes, our DPR box goes to white and it never goes back to below white. This thing really pumps out good damage besides all of the other cool stuff that it does, so I'm really liking this build. No change to our round one and two. At level 16, we get Rogue 10 to add another ASI, which will be Alert. Gives us a nice Terms of Engagement buff. Our initiative is pretty solid now at plus 10. We can't be surprised. We get awesome defense when we're under the effects of Heavy Obscurement. Just one of the best feats in the game. I'm always happy to add it. No change to our round one and two, no change to our DPR situation. At level 17, we enter tier four. We get an 11th level of rogue and reliable talent is online for a huge utility and interactions buff. 
man, such a nice ad for a skill monkey build like ours. We've got all of these expertises and side bolstered knack and reliable talent. We are just sticking those proficiency rolls all day long, loving it. And we get a bump to our sneak attack. So our numbers bump again and we just keep pulling away. Sneak attack is really cool in that it just continues to bump throughout tier three and four, whereas the other DPR outputs tend to top out at level 11. No change to our round one and two. At level 18, we get another ASI by adding row 12. So I'm going with resilient wisdom here. Going to close that wisdom save hole. Kind of similar to slippery mind, which rogues normally get anyway, but we're not going to get high enough rogue level. So it fits thematically. No change to our round one and two. No change to our DPR situation, still solidly white. At level 19, Psychic Veil comes online, and I love this. This is a fantastic version of invisibility. It has more relaxed end conditions, so we can actually cast spells without breaking the invisibility, and we can do it over and over. It's essentially available at will now. So very nice add for this concept in my opinion. We get our final bump to sneak attack, so we reach our highest DPR output, which is fantastic, solidly white. No change to our round one and two. And then finally at level 20, I'm throwing a curveball. We are gonna take an out of left field peace cleric dip, just because I don't wanna add another rogue level. That just gets us blind sense, and blind sense sucks. And we now have a wisdom 13 after adding resilient at level 18, so we do qualify for the cleric dip. And when I look at it, it seems to me like Peace offers the strongest available one level dip for us at this point. I mean, that said, we can do other dips. We can do any Cleric, any Sorcerer. We can add Fighter 2, we can add Warlock 6. Lots of options here. Peace is kind of broken, I admit. I think Trickery might be a nice option as a sneaky good way of getting your Phantom Steed advantage on its stealth checks. Because remember, it's going to be invisible when you cast it. So that can be a nice little combo there. But I said, what the heck, let's go with peace and add that emboldening bond. We're gonna be able to proc it all the time because our familiar is gonna be right there in our backpack and it helps our allies, so why not? Proficiency times per day, we're gonna be able to do it six times a day. We're gonna have a lot of impact when we can pre-buff, although note, only use it when you can pre-buff. And I just think it's a pretty cool capstone. I'm not gonna bother adjusting the DPR box for it because I would literally have to double everything and it's only gonna bump the numbers a teeny little bit because it actually doesn't make much difference when you already hit almost all the time anyway, which we do. It'll mostly help our party and it's gonna help our initiative and our saves and stuff. So really nice add, but not a big difference in the damage department. And because we get a level of cleric, we get some cantrips. I'm going with Toll the Dead, Mending, and Word of Radiance. We add some spells. So Heroism and Sanctuary come with the domain. Bless and Healing Word, I think are nice ads. It's all self-explanatory, right? No change to our round one and two, no change to our DPR situation. Still solidly white. We've been crushing it in the DPR situation for the last seven, eight levels, really this whole career. So that's it. That is the Celestial Soul Knife, a really cool character. I'm actually gonna play this character myself in the Barbarous Britain campaign. I will talk about that in, uh, you know, in that series. But I'm really pleased with this build, man. It's got really great damage output. It's got really great mobility. It's got really great healing ability. It's got a really great skills ability. Uh, it's really helpful with that telepathic thing. I mean, creating a telepathic bond between the party members is just so sneaky good. Having that tongues ability. I mean, this is a really, really good character. I'm really um, impressed with the rogue in general really impressed with the soul knife and uh, I hope you know my patron's girlfriend likes this build but let me know what you think in the comments below is there any way that I can make this better and regardless thank you so much for watching this has been Bill Bronson Dragons I'm your host Bill Bron Bafflestone see you next time